All right, marketing. You guys having a good day so far? Yes. Yes? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. My name's Aaron Keith. I'll be leading the workshop today. I know you guys have a lot of workshops to choose from, so really thank you for spending a little bit of time in here. We have 45 minutes. I'm going to try to stretch it to an hour. There's supposedly nothing after this. So stay if you'd like. The doors will be locked until we're done. <laughs> All right, so today is all about marketing, so I want to go over what the intention of today is. This is what I want to fulfill on today. How consistent engagement and on-brand content equals actions that pierce through the noise and produce results. What I really want to focus on that intention, so keep this in the background today, is pierce the noise. I want your marketing to land and produce results. The, the center of what we're talking about today is going to be a marketing plan. We're going to, we're going to get to that. We're going to start with a few other systems first. Your marketing plan is foundational for agents to grow and to excel. But I want to lay a little bit of foundation before we, we get there. So first system I want to cover is your personal brand description. What's a personal brand description? What do you guys think that is? Oh, this is a full contact seminar. If you don't raise your hand, I just call on you. So what's a personal brand description? How you describe yourself. How you describe yourself. Sorry, I was waving. That's fine. Go ahead. Since you waved. No, you're good. We're just going to call on you more. What's you about? What's your, what are you about? Yeah. Okay. What sets you apart? What sets you apart? What else? Your profile. Your profile? How people recognize you. How people recognize you. What else? How I can service you. How I can service you. Good. Yeah, your personal brand description is a document. Remember, this, we're talking systems today. This is a system. It's not something that's conceptual. This isn't in your head. Your personal brand description should be a written document that depicts who you are. What do you stand for? What are you all about? It should have four or five, six words that encapsulate what your personal brand is all about. Why does this matter? Why do we need to know this information? Yeah. So you build on it consistently. So you build on it consistently. And, identify and people can identify you that way. Yeah, good. What else? The front of the room is killing the back of the room right now. Uh, All right, we'll just walk down here and talk to people. To make an impression. To make an impression. Okay, trust. good. Build trust. Build trust. Good. What else? Common ground with people. Common ground with people. Yeah, very much. Your personal brand description, one of the main things it's there to do, it does a lot of things. One of the main things I want it to do is give life to your content. Marketing is about communication. Can we agree on that? Yes. He's leading next. Stay up here. Marketing is about communicating and communicating effectively. So I don't just want you guys to have systems just to have systems so you can say you did. I want you to have systems that work. I'm very big on effectiveness. Word comes up a lot. Your personal brand description is going to give life to content. We want that content to pierce the noise and land and produce results. Can we agree that there's a lot of noise these days? Yes. I, I spent the week, I'm from San Diego. I spent the week in New York prior to coming here. Wow, a lot of noise, way more than San Diego. And I don't just mean that in a funny way, I'm serious. There's so much noise, the amount of emails, social media, there's so much interaction that if you're putting out content to put out content, you're just adding to the noise. You're not piercing through. So one of the systems, so everyone write this down, one of your homework assignments is to document your personal brand description. We're not going to get through everything there is to, to talk about in the world of marketing in one hour. So at the end, come see me if you have specific questions on this. Your personal brand description. So some of the things that you could put on there could be your colors. What, what colors? What are your ta what's your tagline? Your logo? What do you stand for? What are you all about? What are your differentiators? I'm sure today you've heard differentiators from other people, yes? Who's in the video next door, the, the video uh, seminar? Yeah, you have to differentiate yourself, yes? <coughs> Through content, video content. This document should give you any vendors you hire. If you hire a graphic designer, a videographer, a website person, 
any vendor that you ever hire that's helping with anything marketing related will look at this document so they understand your brand. They build stuff based on what you told them you're all about. Does that make sense? All right, any questions on this piece before we move to the next one? Ooh, that was close. She touched her hair. It is. It's getting expensive. All right, any questions? We roll? Yes. The differentiators? Yeah, because otherwise I feel like we're all doing the same thing. 100%. So just to, to keep this conversation consistent, so across the, the hall here was a uh, seminar on video. And Ivan Estrada was leading that. Um, I know Ivan well. Ivan used to be a CPA. So he can leverage being a CPA in his marketing. It differentiates him from other agents or brokers. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, let's say you had an interior design background or a construction background. I know some agents that have that, and they use that to their advantage in how they position themselves in the market. That makes sense? I have a skincare background. How do I do that? See me at the end, I'm gonna see if I can figure that one out. Not the easiest one. Thank you for giving me an easy one to work on today. That is not an easy one. Any other questions about your personal brand description? What it should be about, what should go in it? Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, so let's fast forward and pretend that we now know exactly who, our, who we are as a brand, our personal brand. We've depicted that as crystal clear. The next thing we need to look at is the other side of that coin, the customer. You all need to know who your target market is, who your ideal customer is. So someone give me an example. Who's, do you mind, who, who's your ideal customer? Someone buying their first home. All right, great. Someone who's ready to buy. Someone who has what I call the burning platform. The burning platform, okay. Yeah, someone who's divorcing. Someone who's divorcing? No, no, that's actually the most accurate one we've heard so far. I do a lot of probate estate work. Huge, yes. Uh, short list for adoption, you need a two bed, a two or three bed. Got it. <coughs> Investors. Investors, good. What else? Vacation homes. Vacation homes? Family with two kids that want to live on the water. Family with two kids that want to live on the water. In Florida. In Florida, got it, totally clear. Yes, your, your ideal customer, it's a, it's, you're profiling someone. You are profiling who you want to work with, not who you're already working with. That's already happening. I want you to know who you want to be working with. Um, just because I don't know most of you in this room, um, there are certain brokers I work with that are very high-end brokers, all the way down to brokers that are just started yesterday. Some brokers, depending on where you are in your business evolution, have two markets. They have two ideal customers. I have some big teams that they have a branch of their revenue is coming from rentals. And they have their ideal customer in the domain or revenue stream of rentals, right? And they have a, another revenue stream of their, their high end. They want 15, 20 million dollar listings. You can have multiple target markets depending on how you built out your business. But you need to profile those people. You need to know exactly how old they are, what they do for a living. You need to know what their interests are. Where do they shop? They shop, they like Lululemon, they shop at Nordstrom's. What are they, what are they into? Does that make sense? Why do we need to know this information? To understand their needs. But why? To target, to target them. To target them. And it, and if, right. Yeah, the message has to do what? Land. It has to pierce the noise. So if your brand, your personal brand is very crystal clear and fleshed out, and now you know exactly who the human is that you're trying to target, then you can bring that together and actually have content that works. You guys get that? We need content that works, not just content. But from what I see from a lot of brokers, and I've coached a lot of brokers. I've co I mean, I coach about 60 CEOs a week from all over the world. I've been doing this 15 years. I've coached thousands and thousands of people. And I can tell you from the, that Petri dish of people, most people are just putting out random content, hoping something sticks. Once it sticks, they're gonna go do more of that. But they're hoping. 
We don't want that. We want to know who our human is or humans are that we're trying to target. Then start to formulate content strategies to go and touch those people and connect. Does that make sense? Any questions on this piece? Is it starting to make sense? All right. No questions? Yeah, please. I have a team. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a real example. So two people to your left is a, is a woman, and I coach her and her team. You know, she is on a team. And the, the head of her team is a client of mine for a long time. And so that person's brand is very well articulated. In my opinion, it's one of the I think, best fleshed out brands in Douglas Elliman right now. And each person on her team is a different age with a different skill set and a different focus. Each one of them has to create their own personalized brand underneath the umbrella that they're working in. As a team leader, that's part of your job is to sit with them and help them flesh that out. What makes them different? What are their interests? What are they, what are they good at communicating? Um, I have a couple people on the team right now that have an art background and a music background. So we're leveraging that. Their personal newsletter is way more culturally focused. It's all about bands, artists, what's coming into town, the, the whole scene. Because that's what differentiates them, and they're passionate about speaking about that. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question, though? Your face does not look like I answered the question. <laughs> the, the, the team gets a brand, right? Yeah. And the individuals within that team can turn over over time. Yep. I'm here 15 years, too. Yeah. Got it. So the way you do that is the, the owner of the, the team, you, the lead, it's your brand, first and foremost. So it's your job to craft the overarching brand, the colors, the logo, all of that fun stuff. And underneath that, they can alter some things that fit their personality. But the way I coach, so if you had a newsletter template, they would use your newsletter. Your colors, your look, your feel would be very much the same. They can change some of the content to better tailor to fit them, but you always want the uniformity of the team. So in other words, I would not allow every team member to have their own individualized newsletter with their own colors, all that other stuff. I would not allow that. It's too distracting. Then there's no uniformity in the brand. Make sense? Does that answer it? Awesome. And come see me at the end. I can dive into specific detail. Yeah, definitely. What are the questions you guys have? Really? Okay. <laughs> I'm getting worried. Okay. We've described your own personal brand. we figured out who your target market and your ideal customer is. Now let's start to bring this together. Let's start to talk about your marketing action plan. This is really the meat and potatoes of the system. The marketing action plan is a system. What do you think that system is comprised of? Action steps, I heard consistency. Action steps, what else? Checklists. Checklists. Come on back in the room, step it up. Research. Research. Budget. Budget, ooh, I like that one. What else? Calendar. What's that? Calendar. Calendar, yes. It is literally 90 degrees back here. <laughs> Process. Process. Gil, what's it comprised of? A plan. Yeah, we want strategy, the, and the consistency is huge. So here's what I would suggest. We'll get into the marketing actions in a minute. I want to build out the structure, the system, right? This is all about systems. Systems are consistent. Your marketing action plan should have the actions that you're going to take over the course of a year broken up by month. Then we want to know how frequently that action is going to be taken over the course of the year. We want to know what staff member or what human is responsible for executing that action. We want to know how much that's going to cost us per month, per year. That makes sense? Any questions on that? Sorry. No questions on that? We're clear? 
For the full year or for breaking it? Month and year. Month and year. Yeah, so easy example. Let's take um, uh, hard mail. A lot of people do hard mail. So let's say you're going to hard mail every other month. You want to figure out, okay, over the course of 12 months, I'm going to probably spend this much in hard mail. Divide that by 12. My average monthly marketing expense is going to be X. It may not happen every month, but you know that you need to set aside X amount of dollars every month for that. But you want to market it the whole year so you have a consistency on it. Bingo. Perfect. Yeah, you don't want your budget spiking every other month. That's, exactly. that's not fun to anybody. Does that make sense? A lot of you, I, I get this question a lot. How much should I be spending on marketing a year? That too. 15. Yeah, 10 to 15%. But a lot of people, they, they have no concept of percentages like that. Exactly. They need to actually know. So if we build a marketing plan, I can actually tell you. You can actually see the dollars yourself and see, does this marketing plan equal my budget? If it doesn't, great. What's going to get cut? Or, oh, I have extra money. What should I add? So it allows you to accurately strategize and plan. Does that make sense? So what would be the perfect percentage? Startup, when you have, let's, and I'm talking about, uh, I'm a manager, and, I, and when, that, when there's a new agent or an agent that has been in the business and they're frustrated because they haven't gotten any results, they come to us with all these tools that we provide in Douglas Element. Yeah. They say, okay, how much will I need to start a business plan? Here's what the, would you recommend? It's going to be what he said. It's how much you can afford. Because when, it, when a new agent starts, they're not making revenue. Right? So it's not, it's not a matter of it's 10, 15% of anything. It's they don't, they have to come in with a surplus or else they're going to be working at Starbucks tomorrow. Seriously. Right? Because we know this, this industry has, it takes some runway to get this thing off the, off the ground. So you need to basically tell them it's what they can afford. And I'm going to answer your question differently than you probably are going to want. It's not about as much the money as it is the actions. So I'm going to get in the action in, in like two minutes. So hold tight on that part. As far as the money, I wouldn't get too wrapped up in it. I would build the marketing plan, see what's going to cost, and then start to strategize. What can I afford first, second, third, and fourth? Is everyone, your marketing action plan should be a timeline of events that you want to be taking. I own several companies. One of the companies I own is a medical clinic in San Diego. We do concierge medicine. And our marketing plan is, on Excel, it's like that long. I haven't done half the actions yet. And I may never need to get to the bottom of that list. I built the plan full Monty. I went crazy on that thing. And if I ever need to, I'll get to the end of the list. For a lot of you, I hope you don't ever have to go that far. So a lot of it is building out every single action from things that have a, ha a really high return on investment down to ones that have a very low return on investment. The point is right here, Get a structure. You all need a system you're following. All right, want to talk actions? Yes, yes. yes. All right, let's talk actions. There's, there's a tremendous amount of actions to talk about. I'm going to focus on your database. Can we agree on that for a little bit? Can we focus on database? And then you can ask me questions about exterior things. The reason I want to focus on the database, I think it's the foundation. I really do. For, for I don't care if you started your real estate practice yesterday, you've been doing this 20 years, your absolute foundation is the database. Your database needs to be broken up, segmented. Why do we need to segment the database? To target the avatar. To target the avatar. To be effective. To be effective. Darren. Why do we go after our database? Why do we have to segment our database? See, they're not paying attention in the back. No, because there's, there's certain Right. You, it's all about effectiveness, right? We want, we want things to pierce the noise. So what are some of the segments we need in our database? Former active, not active. Former clients. Former clients. Friends. I heard active, not active up here. Former Just friends. 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 Family, price Family price points. Colleagues. Colleagues. Acquaintances. Acquaintances. I'm telling you, the front half of this thing is killing it. <laughs> Owners? Other brokers and stuff that you Yes. Most of you don't do that. It's very surprising to me. There's not a lot of agents that market other brokers well. Yes? Builders, developers. Builders, developers. Good one. Online leads that you, know, that you come in, you know, whether you're getting your leads from open houses, 
classes or just you know from your website you know you just I segment try to segment you know hey this, this came from online and try to you know market towards that good you know, because they're going to be a different mindset from some of the other absolutely so some of the ones that I, I use this is this is common this isn't Anything that I personally have created, you've heard this a million times from different people. Have you heard of the A's, B's, and C's? Yes. yes. Awesome. There's tier one, tier two, tier three. There's a million different versions of this. The whole point is we need to have your top tier clients. I'm not going to go into painstaking detail. See me at the end if you want. Uh, your top tier database needs to be segmented. Why your top tier? Why, why do they specifically need to be segmented out? Frequency. What's that? Frequency. Frequency, yeah. And? True, true, but also money. If you're going to spend money, spend it on the people that are the most related to you, that have the highest return on investment. And also ROT, return on time. Spend your time and money on the people you're going to get the best return on. So it helps to, to segment those people. Your next segment I'd call your Bs, people who know you. They may not have bought or sold with you yet or sent you business yet, but you know them. These are people who are warm contacts. To me, this, this next segment is probably the most valuable. We want to turn that middle segment, that B segment, into A's. Convert the B's to A's. That's the way we want all the contacts to move. We want them to move upstream. C's, it's a catch-all for me. You met someone at a networking event that gave you the card to see. You don't know who they are, cold contacts, internet leads that you don't know that never, that fizzled out. I throw them into C's. We'll drip on them. The next segment I love, and I think it's very underutilized in real estate, and I don't know why, is business alliances. People will call it your, uh, your B2B. What's a business alliance? Anyone know? Lawyers. Say, we'll say it one more time. Bankers and attorneys. Bankers and attorneys. I heard mortgage. Yeah. Financial, Financial Yes. Business alliances is a massive segment of people that I would, uh, I would guess most of you could expand. CPAs, wealth managers, divorce attorneys, divorce mediation companies, which is different, um, interior designers, architects, builders, contractors, there's on and on and on. You want to find those professionals, get them in the database. Makes a huge difference. All right, so now let's get to the actual actions themselves. Phone calls. It's a dying art. Many of you have forgotten how to talk on the phone. I'm sorry. It works. We're in the communication business. People are spending a lot of money with us, making a very expensive purchase. They need to hear from us. Over the phone is highly effective. So I just want to make sure everyone's present to this because I can tell it's missing in the room now. We're going to talk about actions that do what? Pierce the noise. So just because you're calling, that's an action. What's the content behind the action? So if someone give me an example, what's good content behind a phone call? Nails on chalkboard. Information on your neighborhood. To show interest in how they're doing. Yes. How are the kids? How are the kids? Where'd you go on vacation? What's going on? So again, this is just my opinion. My opinion is not the right opinion. It's just an opinion today. So just take it for whatever it's worth. In my opinion, if you're going to call your clients a couple times a year, half of those calls can be referral based. Half of those calls, you're building relationships. This is a relationship business. Build them. No one cares about real estate that much. They don't. How often do people buy homes? Every couple months? Seven years. Every year? Seven years. Four or five Seven to ten years. Yeah, four or five times in their life. Do, do you think they care about real estate every month? Do you? Awesome. I think it's an aspect, but I can't, I don't, I can't agree that it would be the focus. Not, again, what I'm saying is not right. It's just an opinion, right? Right. We want content that's diverse. 
If you're only real estate focused, from our experience, you lose people. You lose engagement. Should we not talk about real estate all the time? No, but it has to be blended with other subjects. Why? Because we want to engage that human. You have to be relevant. You have to provide value. So for your content to pierce the noise and produce results has to match your brand, has to match their interests, so it lands. So you need to find interests and content that you think your ideal customer wants to hear about. So let's just say you're in San Francisco. If you're a San Francisco agent and you think your content is going to pierce and you start talking about green technology and green building, in that market that probably works really well because statistically they're very interested in that. If you know your market, you know your ideal customer, you can start to form content that they're going to really eat up. And after you've talked about that new solar technology that is launched, then you can mention that next listing that you just got <laughs> or that pocket listing that you have. Because now you're providing valuable content and they're, they're, they're reading your stuff. They're engaged in your stuff. Make sense? All right, let's move on from phone calls. Uh, video. I'm a huge fan of video. I think if you're not doing video, you're in the Stone Age a little bit. It's just the way the world's gone, whether you like it or not. I know, most people are cringing at this one. Please. What's that? What are your thoughts, opinions? On BombBomb? Bomb? I use BombBomb bomb in my other company. I'm a fan. I think it's a little expensive. I wish it was a little cheaper. But uh, she mentioned BombBomb. Bomb. Sorry. BombBomb uh, bomb is one of many companies that what they do is they're very effective at sending mass video out via email. Uh, can the tech guy weigh on this one really fast? So, yeah. there you go. Yeah, it's, it's a horrible name, in my opinion, Bomb Bomb, B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B dot com. Don't know why they named it that. What's that? Explosive results. Explosive results, there you go. Yeah. What, what the tech, so Ryan's a tech consultant. He's one of the top tech consultants in the country. Um, he works with a lot of DE agents. And what it does is instead of taking you somewhere to see a video, like taking you over to YouTube, it actually plays the video in the body of the email. And that convenience is very nice. It's very polished. Uh, it's very user friendly. I'm not very techy, so I can vouch for that. Works great. It's, I think it's, depending on your contact list, around 500 a year. That ring a bell? How much? 1,500. I pay 500 for me. I have 4,000 people in my database. Yeah, I guess it, it depends on how many people you have in your database. We, I think we have like 4,000. And they said something, how many times do you have 4,000? Whenever we want. It's like MailChimp or Constant Contact. It's a, ma it's, a, it's a company where you upload all your contacts, and you can send video, you can send newsletters. No, 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 it's an annual subscription, I believe. Yeah, don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm pretty sure we pay annually. And I think it's like 500 a year for us. It depends on your volume of contacts, though. Yeah? Are there any other cheaper options? Tech guy. Any cheaper options? So there, there are, but statistically, you're going to get more out of the videos that you're producing by using BombBomb, because over 80% of people that actually click play on average. Wow. Any less play on BombBomb? Yeah. Absolutely. Ryan, you step around the corner next time. Yeah. There you go. The video guy's trying to get you in the shot. Yeah, Skill. So what's the advantage of, uh, of using BombBomb bomb as opposed to a photo with a, with a link embedded that'll take you to another site that won't cost you that space? It's just your effectiveness is going to drop a little bit. It's convenience. More people are willing to play something right there in the body of the email versus having to go somewhere else. Darren, real quick, yeah. Well, I was just going to say one of the benefits to everyone using this is that you have a three-second teaser when you have the email open. That's the, it's the only platform that uh, you're able to do that with. So if there's a teaser that says, hey, hey, check out my video, your video is actually there without them playing the video. So that's a big benefit. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm not an advocate. I don't have the program yet. But I understand they have a back-end statistic thing mm -hmm. that Hey, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. Oh my goodness, I just watched your video. Mm -hmm. Whoa, 
Yeah, so I listed it. So they have this whole thing. The analytics in the background are, are very nice. But you get push notifications, mm -hmm. so you can now call the one of those four thousand who just watched your video. Right. And oh, what a coincidence! Well, I'm glad we're talking. Let's go make a call. And you can see how many stalkers you have. So they'll watch it like sixteen <laughs> times. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's really trippy to watch. You see some people played your video like twenty-three times. Like, wow. Oh my gosh. Content on the video, I can't, again, remember, I can't answer exact content. It depends on your brand, who your ideal customer is, and from there you can formulate content and strategies that you think is going to pierce that. That's the whole point here is I can't coach you specifically as a group on content. All I can tell you is I need to know who you're trying to market to, what your brand is, and then I can coach you on strategies and actions that's going to pierce. But you have to do that work first. Or people like myself can't really help. You, you have to do that foundational work. So, so we don't go way crazy on video. We have a lot to cover. See me at the end if you have video questions. E-newsletter. Anyone do e-newsletters? Anyone have no interest at all in doing e-newsletters? OK, so who's not going to raise your hand no matter what question I ask? Just out of curiosity. All right, awesome. <laughs> So I think e-newsletters have some, some value. I know a lot of people say they're very old school. Uh, I think there's new versions of, of doing that these days. Your newsletter can be very short. It does not have to be long and lengthy. I'm just going to give some general coaching on newsletter effectiveness, since a lot of people want to do them or are doing them. To the discussion that we're having about real estate and how relevant it is in all of your marketing, I believe if your first one or two sections are value-based content. Content where you're giving someone value, giving them some, some useful resources, you're going to have a better overall engagement over the long term. Why would that be? Distribute yeah. If you're giving people valuable content and resources in the first couple sections of your newsletter, why will that help your engagement over the long term? Not spamming them. What else? But why? But why? Yeah. Your job is to train your customers what you're all about. And hopefully, you've positioned yourself that what you're all about is valuable to them. That way, if you're staying relevant and top of mind, when you have a pocket listing, you have something you need to move, and you're putting your, your real estate in your newsletter more toward the bottom section, you're going to engage in that. So usually the first one or two sections, I want to be valuable content. You can put your listings, pocket listings, anything like that toward the bottom. That makes sense? Yes. Questions? Yes, yeah, Gil. Mm -hmm. Would you think that it makes sense if you're working on a wide spectrum to create multiple newsletters with varied content, more targeting your clients' unique scenarios? You can. It depends on bandwidth. Um, the way I usually build most marketing plans is my newsletter is very vanilla. It should be able to reach all the people in my database. My only exception to that. You were saying. See? <laughs> they agree. The only exception to that in my world is out of area real estate agents. So let's say Darren Tanzi is a, is a Florida agent, Florida broker, and he wants to market to Gill in Long Island, New York. Well, that can work. That could definitely work. So if Gill in his database took all the agents that are in Florida, put them in his own folder, and started marketing all the agents in Florida, that'd be a wise idea. Many of you can be doing this. Very few agents in my experience actually do. And the few agents that I've seen do it do get business out of it. Because they've positioned themselves as the expert in that area to brokers on the other side of the pond. Works good. So it's up to you how segmented you want to go. It really is. I just gave you the basics, whether it's an A or B, a C, a business alliance, an out of area agent. You can break it down way more than that. It's really up to you. Yeah. Contacting me about this, 
I need a place and I need it soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got like, people, you've already helped them. Right. You just want to keep kind of in touch. And with them, you're giving more like oh, community news or this is kind of cool, this is going on in the neighborhood. That's what, you know, so it's, it's more a general neighborhood newsletter. Okay. So the one is more real estate focused than the other one. Is, and that's nope. Okay. Nope, nope, nope. Mm -mm. So if someone is actively buying or selling with you, it's not who I'm talking about today. I'm talking about all the people who live in your database. And the people who are buying and selling with you will be categorized somewhere in your database as well. I need you to stay in contact with your entire world. If you know them, they should be hearing from you via phone, video, e-newsletter, events. There's a new one. Events. I think events are highly effective. I know some people get intimidated about events like they do video. Events are highly, highly effective. Why are they so effective? Anyone know? Very memorable. Very memorable. It gives people something to do. Gives something people to do. Direct engagement. Direct engagement. What else? They feel special. They feel special. You're giving them the experience. Giving them the experience. More personality. More person. Yep. Well, you're knowledgeable. You're knowledgeable. All of that is correct. 100% correct, and what's that? It, it definitely grows the sphere. Events help grow the size of your database, which most of us need. The other thing that it does, which is super critical, um, I don't know if I can do the math off the top of my head, so let's make up a scenario. Let's say you spend $5,000 on an event, and you have 100 people there. The dollar per head you just spent to be eyeball to eyeball and to connect is priceless. See, hold on quick. When you guys are newer agents or mid-level agents, you have a little bit of time. As the company grows, you have no time, none, zero. So to have two hours, to have 100 people in a room where you can connect for a couple minutes, like real connection, see them, give them the hug, that connection goes miles. Yep. And if you start building up your business alliances, which we talked about like 20 minutes ago, and you're, you're building up a relationship with a financial advisor, soon that financial advisor and you can do a joint event together. He or she brings their top 20, you bring your top 20, now you're sharing expenses and sharing database. That works. You're going to be late. There's a lot of traffic, I'm telling you. <laughs> Have you not seen how busy this room is? You're not getting out of the back. Yes. Okay, so I've been told to do this for years, and so you're stubborn. Well, because I don't want to throw a party and have nobody show up. Uh, uh, so you play. So what happened when you're five? <laughs> no, it's all of our fear, right? We all have the fear of like we're gonna throw a party, no one's gonna come to our birthday party. We need a hug. But it's true. It's, it's happened to all of us. Please. We're all coming. We're all coming. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Yeah, let me, um, let, me, let me throw something in the space first, and then I'm going to answer the question. Oh, you can make them small, too. No, no, I'll get to the small ones. 100%. I'll give you some examples. First, let me throw something in the space. Let me back up here. In my opinion, hear me out before you judge. In my opinion, I think to some degree real estate is simple. I think it's simple from the standpoint of being effective in real estate is how many people know you and trust you and think of you as their go-to real estate expert that they're going to call when they need something that's real estate related. That's, that's my belief structure. I'm not saying it's the right one, it's just a belief structure of mine. 
So let's just take on for a second that that's the case. How many people can we get to trust us, to think of us as their go-to real estate expert? So when they need something, they're going to call us. So let's just work with that for a second. And let's roll on events. So if we're trying to position ourselves as an expert and someone who's relevant, right? Because they have to stay connected to us. Because there's younger, hunger, hungrier brokers that are going to be way more annoying than you. And all of you in here have probably lost out on a deal that you knew that person really well and some young person who they didn't know spoke a really good game, caught them at the right time, and stole it from you. I hear it every couple weeks from some of my brokers. So it's about holding that relationship tight. Events are a great way of doing that in mass scale. So it's cheap dollars per hour. All right, so examples. Your events can be small or large. Some people are very good at large events. Some people are not. You gotta know your strengths. If you're like, listen, 40 people is gonna freak me out. Get in there, yeah, get in there, get in there. Hold on. So it depends. Small events could be eight, 10, 12 people. Big events, a couple hundred. There's all kinds of different events. So some cheap events that a lot of my clients do, Halloween's coming up, so we'll go off Halloween. Pumpkin patch. A couple of my clients right now do pumpkin patch. They ran out of pumpkin patch for four hours. They invite all of their database. They pay for one pumpkin per family, or per, sorry, per kid. Cost them a couple thousand bucks. Uh, he knows this client, Heather Roxburgh. She had 600 people at her pumpkin patch event last week. It's a lot of hugging. <laughs> but she's also one of the number one brokers in Utah. Yeah, she basically went there. She has a photographer there. That's one of her, her nice little, little <coughs> options. She puts up a little photo booth. Every family gets photoed before they go into the event. Then she takes the photos and sends them to all her top clients and puts them up on a website so people can download. Little value add. Um, I know some for things, I'm just going off the, the time of year. Uh, Thanksgiving is another one. I know a lot of people that do like a, a pie party. Yeah, Pi Party works great. You basically call your top clients. You can't do your whole database unless you have deep pockets. Find out what their, their pie is that they want, Costco or wherever your, your jam is. Bring it to the office. They all have to come by, pick it up. You have a little, some cocktail hour, shake hands, kiss babies, in and out very fast. Great way of doing it. Another kind of event, business alliances. Again, I'm really big on this sector, so I'm going to bring this one up. Let's say you get an attorney, a divorce, uh, sorry, a divorce attorney, family law attorney, a uh, divorce mediator, and a wealth manager and a CPA. Five people. Sorry. I had coffee. Divorce mediator, family law attorney, CPA, what they said. Finan financial advisor. Wealth, yeah. Mediator, fa family law, divorce attorney, and CPA, wealth manager. You get those businesses together five people, we can handle that. Invite them to drinks, invite them all to dinner because they can all network with each other. It's a lot of value. So not only are you providing value, but you're building your team around you. Does that make sense? Yes, yes? yes. But it is. We get on video, then we get on video. You have to have people come to you. Yeah. There's no pumpkin patch in Central Park. Correct. So you have to create that thing that people want to go to. Right. Once you start doing these parties, how many of these do I do? People look forward to them. OK, the first one, not many people come. You hate those people. But you keep doing them. Yeah. I wish I planted in. That's perfect. Do what he said. Yes.
Yep. Yeah. Make it a thing. Yep. All right, guys, we, we're like completely out of time. I need to jam something in in two minutes. Can you give me two minutes? Yes. Okay, great. See me at the end if you ever want to talk marketing. I got time. Um, stats. So we've, we know who our ideal customer is. You've built your brand description. Your content's coming together. You built this marketing plan. You're following your marketing plan and putting out content in all kinds of different ways and forms and communicating. And you're actually reaching people. Whew. Now what? We've got to track it. We have to track results. Here's the system that I want. Everybody in this room who's doing marketing needs a lead tracking form. Here's what lead tracking form is. It's tracking when the lead came in. It's tracking the source of that lead. And it's tracking did that lead convert and to become a customer, someone who actually hired you to buy or sell their property. We need to track the source so that you know the time you're investing is actually producing results or not. The money you're investing is actually producing results or not. I watch a lot of you spend all kinds of money and time on things. You have no idea if it's producing results. Any questions on this system? Please. How, sorry. Yeah. It's going to depend on what it is. If it's video or an e-newsletter, you should be able to, to see that result in a couple months based on engagement. Are you going to get a listing because you sent out a newsletter yesterday? No. no it's I'm talking more about like hard mail or something like that? I'm talking more like, um, well, there's hard mail, but, you know, which is really tough to track because with, with email, you can see if someone's just, if it's bouncing, if someone's just going into the trash, if it's ever opened, if there's any click <coughs> Mm -hmm. You know, or you buy a certain building, kind of sure. placement over there. How long to actually give towards that to see, you know, is three months, six months, or does one need to do a year to get a full cycle to see where it's going to depend. See me at the end so we can go in the detail. So if you're doing like hard mail toward a building, it's going to be six months to a year for hard mail, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a financial commitment, hard mail is. Anything about the tracking that you guys need to know? Yeah. What system do you use? I use Excel. Yeah, I use, I use a very simple Excel spreadsheet. A lot of the teams that I coach, that's what they use. It's, it's super simple. Lead comes in, type their name down. Next column over, you, you list where the lead came from. And it's all, pre, yeah, the source of the lead. And then the last column is, did they convert to a customer or not? Because you guys want to know this. So you just keep adding columns uh, as you track the evolution of the lead? Yeah, I, I break it down per quarter. So my Excel, I have, my Excel has four sheets, Q1 through Q4. So I track leads uh, per quarter. Here's why. If you are, this is a totally different conversation. Um, how do I say this in a fast way? If you did your 2018 planning, which you're all supposed to be doing right now, it's supposed to be done in the next two weeks, and you know what your sales goal is, and you've broken down your sales goal into minute detail, you should know how many leads you need per month per quarter. So your lead tracking form, if you're smart, you'll put a little line in there so that you can see really quickly, shit, did I produce enough leads this month or not? Holds you accountable. Then you can start to see, guys, is my marketing plan producing the volume of leads that it needs to hit the sales goal? Having a marketing plan and tracking leads when you don't know how many leads you need becomes a challenge. You need to know that information. Because not only do we need to know the source of the lead, is the marketing plan producing the volume you need or not? It's black or white. You either brought in enough leads per month per quarter or you didn't. If it's not, your marketing plan's insufficient. Or there's something about it that's not working. So you're talking about the total number of leads, not just what it funnels down. Correct. Yeah, I want to know cold leads and warm leads. Yeah, you can, I mean, some people break it down to conversations. Some people know that they need, uh, I think it's statistically it's, it's 12 conversations produce a lead. It's 12 or 24, I think it's 12. It's one of those, it's 12 or 24 conversations, someone broke this down, uh, to produce a lead. So that they, I don't know who they are, but they said that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't usually break it down that way. 
All right, I know we're tight on time. Come see me at the end. Thank you. Of course. Good to see you. You too. Mwah. Leave me around. <laughs>